Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading at verse 18 where it says, Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, when I'm wondering how things are supposed to be or how they ought to be or the way that God planned them, I like to look at the first couple of chapters of Genesis because everything from Genesis chapter 3 on is affected in some way by the fall. But in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, there isn't any fall. This is the way it's designed. You know, sometimes folks talk as though we were made for heaven. And that's, I mean, I probably use that phrase myself somewhere along the line, but As a matter of technicality, God made the earth and put man on it. And if you've read the end of Revelation, he doesn't whisk everybody away to heaven and that's the end of the story. He makes a new earth and puts us back on it. His plan has always been for us to have a place here and him to be here with us. And we sometimes get the idea that, you know, that the the way that sounds right would be the way that is right. But the fact is that although it seems a little peculiar to us, he designed it this way. He didn't make us to live in the clouds with him. Hello? You say, so heaven isn't happening? Oh, heaven's a great place to be between the old earth and the new earth. (laughs) But the new earth is where you want to end up. It's got quiet out here. That's where you want to end the story, for sure. Amen? And the point isn't to become ethereal and waft away. The point is we're coming back here to accomplish the original purpose. And something needs to be done there. So when I, I want to know how things are supposed to be, I look at the way they were originally established. And this is the establishment of our marriage relationship right here. This is the pattern. This is before the fall. Every other commandment, every other uh, statement is in some way connected to our fallen nature. But this is the picture of what we are before the fall. Now, none of us live before the fall, but it's useful to look before the fall. Are you still with me? And so I want to spend a few moments just breaking this down a little bit, and then we're going to step on from there to a couple of other things related to it. But when, when he made the statement at verse 18 that it's not good that the man should be alone, I will make him and help meet for him. And then the term, again, help meet is at the end of verse 20, where nothing was found and help meet for him. That phrasing usually conjures some odd images in our minds of exactly what we mean by that. First of all, help or helper tends to be a little bit of a diminutive term in our general usage. We, we you know, are you out there? We find other terms. We call people presidential aides, not presidential helpers, because that sounds cute. <laughs> Hello? And so helper... Um, You know, it sounds like a term that you use with a child. But the fact is that help is not, I mean, the the word we're translating help is not a word which is in any way diminutive. It's uh, easer, it means aid. It's uh, the name of three or four people in the Bible. It's somebody's name. You get named help. Every time they call you, they're calling for help. (laughs) But it's also... uh, it's also a term God uses for himself. He's our help. And if God can be helped, then I guess I can be helped and not be shy about it. It apparently doesn't mean somehow less or other. The other word that's critical here is the word meet. 
And uh, in the margin of this Bible, it says that in the Hebrew, the word meat means as before him. Now, obviously, the English word meat doesn't mean as before him, but the word which gets translated. And uh, modern translations tend to use phrasing something along the lines of helper suitable for him. But uh, that word as before, it, uh, it, it literally means a front or an opposite part. And it comes from a word which means to front or to stand boldly opposite. We're talking about something which when you put them together, they look right that way. Like my left hand and my right hand, which are not the same, but they face each other in a complementary way. And when they're boldly face to face, they fit right. Are you awake? They're not the same, they're not identical, but they fit. And that's what God was talking about, a fit. Somebody who can be right there and it fits. Now, most people get right there and it doesn't fit. In fact, it's pretty good advice, don't get right there with anybody unless you're prepared to fight. But Jenny can get right there anytime because when she's right there, it fits. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about a unique relationship where you can let this person into places that other people don't belong. You can have a lot of friends, but your friends don't get to go to those places. Are you still awake? There's a uniqueness here. And that's what produces the the result that this man declares, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He says, this is the reason that a man's going to leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. This thing is going to be this mystery we call one flesh. And they're able to stand naked and unashamed because of that. Is that making a little bit of sense to you? Now, I have what amounts to a, a very simple point this morning. And you could sum it up in uh, the title I selected, which is Marriage is Honorable. The, uh, that phrase comes directly from Hebrews 13.4, but it comes from the King James Version of the Bible. If you read other translations, they'll use terminology somewhat like the New American Standards, which says, let marriage be held in honor among all. And, and I, I'm good with hold the marriage in honor, but I thought marriage is honorable was a little more direct and to the point. I like the simplicity of it. There is honor in this. Now, don't leave me yet. I'm coming somewhere. We're we're working this together. (laughs) Everybody's still glad you came. (laughs) But uh, marriage is honorable. Now, here's the thing I need to say, I guess, as as we move on a little bit. Let's come over to Ephesians chapter 5. And as you're turning there, let me say... This isn't a message for married people. It is a message for married people because it's a message for all people. But whether you've never been married, whether you're currently married, or whether you've been married but you're not currently married, this message is for all of us. I'm not preaching this message because I'm married. I'm preaching this message because I serve a God who holds marriage in honor and asks me to. And that every one of us has a calling to hold marriage in honor. Now let's understand that this way. We honor firemen. Does anybody besides me honor firemen? I'm not a fireman. I never planned to be a fireman, and I probably never will be a fireman. Doesn't stop me from honoring firemen. Doesn't make me grumpy when other people honor firemen and say, I wish I was a fireman. Everybody's always honoring the firemen. Are you out there? I am glad that there are firemen in the world. I am glad that they respond to that call and fulfill that task. And in a very similar way, every one of us in the body of Christ is called to be glad that there are people who hold marriage in honor in this world, that there are people who hold their marriage in honor, and that they're out there. Whether we're one of them or not is irrelevant We all want to support them and love them and pray for them. Are you awake with me? 
And it isn't about me. It isn't about self-centeredness. It isn't about what's in this for me. This is part of our calling to be outward focused. It's part of our calling to look not everyone on his own good, but on each other's. To be able to look beyond myself and my house and my situation and say, God is doing something with this thing called marriage in the earth and I'm rejoicing with those who are doing it well and supporting them in their efforts to do it. Are you awake? That's the call that we're trying to answer here this morning. That together as a congregation and individually, we are going to answer God's call to hold marriage in honor by holding those who honor marriage in honor and upholding those who marry in Christ. Now you say, well, is marriage for everybody? Well, we don't think being a fireman's for everybody. I think the Bible is very clear. There are some who are called to marry and some who are called to remain unmarried. And in either case, it's an honorable situation if it's the situation that you're called to. But the point is, just because I'm not just like somebody else, just because I don't have an orphanage in Thailand, doesn't mean I don't honor those who respond to that call and do that work. Are you hearing me? And so I want to look at marriage not from the perspective of am I married or am I not married. I want to look at marriage from the perspective of what is God doing with marriage in the earth and how can I be a blessing to those who are married? Still glad you came? Sort of. Okay. (laughs) Now we're in Ephesians chapter 5. So the the foundational understanding of marriage comes to us from Genesis chapter 2. It's something which God brings into the earth that we might become one flesh in a specific, unique relationship which gives us an unusual, complementary person in our life who answers certain aspects of what I'm not by myself. In Ephesians chapter 5, we take it up a notch. And it says here, beginning of verse 21, or verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, there's a great deal of of stuff here to deal with, and we're not going to be able to deal with all of it this morning. But these last two verses uh, focus us on a particular aspect of this calling, which is that in these marriages, we have a calling to become an illustrated sermon of Christ and the church. Now, every one of us as believers have a variety of callings about what we are supposed to illustrate and demonstrate to the world around us, right? And if we were to just kind of, you know, throw up a blackboard here and start taking suggestions, we could probably fill it pretty quickly with different people coming up with different things that you can think, yes, as a matter of fact, I think we're specifically called to show that to the world, not just to tell them about it, but to show them that, to illustrate it for them in some way. Can you think of three or four? Well, somebody else has three or four that you didn't think of. We, it wouldn't take long to get a bunch of them, would it? We all have these callings. But when we enter into a marriage, one of the callings that we have accepted is the calling to become an illustration of Christ and His church. To give people a way of looking at this thing, which is the Scripture calls a great mystery. That's difficult to understand. Now, you guys are all thinking, well, I got hundred songs about that memorized. Yeah, but there was a moment when this whole situation was very baffling to you and probably still isn't as clear as you'd like it to be. 
Are you guys awake? It's Christ and his church. What is the deal with Christ and his church? I, every time I think I've got a handle on it, I realize there's some aspect I haven't included in my model. It's a large and complicated thing to get your head around. But the fact is that a marriage shows us something of that. It doesn't show us the whole story, but it gives us a picture which makes it easier for those of us who need something to see to understand what's going on here. And that is a significant calling because this world needs these things modeled. This world is becoming increasingly a visual world that wants to see things to understand them. And it becomes very important that we're able to present an image that people can recognize. And it has become common in our time to preach that marriage should be like Christ in the church, using Christ in the church as an example, suggesting that our picture of Christ in the church is clearer than our picture of marriage. But the point here at the time was that marriage is supposed to be illustrating Christ in the church. That we should all have a better understanding of marriage than we have of Christ in the church and that we're trying to relate. Are you guys awake? The times have changed. Our understanding has changed. But if we are believers, we need to recognize that this is the calling. And you know, we, as I say, we're conditioned to respect people who, who go off to Guam to start a medical mission. But when somebody answers the call to represent Christ in the church to this world and to form a household which will become a small model of the church, we don't always recognize that as an honorable calling. We don't always recognize that as something that needs to be supported with prayer and that we need to partner with. But it is. It's a little mission encampment on that street. Hello? It's a little mission encampment in that neighborhood. It's a little mission compound in that school system. It's a little mission compound in that local economy. A beachhead set there to show that everything isn't always just as you've experienced it. That there is something else happening out here. That it can be different than what you've seen and what you've known. Now it becomes critically important if that's going to be the case that we not model what we're doing after what everybody else is doing. That you not allow television sitcoms to define for you what being a household is. That you not allow uh, simplistic definitions. You know, in our society, we've come to the idea that what it means to be a man is to figure out what it means to be a woman and to be the opposite of that. Whatever it is that's woman, that's other. So I'm this. And that's where we end up with some of these incredibly stupid notions of what manhood is about, which are being put forward today as the norm. Are you guys awake? I mean, there's people whose entire career is built on the idea that man is the opposite of woman. Man is the complement of woman, not the opposite of woman. There are differences. There are similarities. They work together because the differences are supportive and the similarities are supportive. Are you awake? Yes. Man is not opposite of woman. Why did it get quiet again? In, in fact, the, the pattern is, is stated for us about as succinctly as it could be in verse 23 when it says, The husband is the head of wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. The point is, Jesus needs to be our example. Let me say that again. Jesus needs to be our example. Now, I don't know what kind of entertainment you avail yourself of, but I have not seen Jesus as the example portrayed in any movie I've seen in a very long time. I've not seen Jesus as the example portrayed in any television program, comedy or drama, in a very long time. I've not seen, you know, we like that word head. 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 That makes me the boss, right? Like Jesus is the boss, right? 
We know Jesus is the boss because he sits in the corner office and tells everybody what to do. Is that the Jesus that we love? Is that the Jesus we were just singing about? He's our head because he's our covenant head. He represents us in the covenant. He is on duty making sure that the demands of the covenant are met by the household and that the blessings of the covenant are experienced by the household. Are we awake? That's a pretty high calling. It's a little different than I'm the boss. It's got real quiet out here. This whole picture of a relationship where there is a mutual love, a mutual respect, and a mutual caring is not typical of anything we usually see modeled for us in this world. And yet it is exactly typical of Christ in the church. Now, if we understand this, understand this calling to model this, to demonstrate this, to illustrate this, let me take you another step in cultural analysis here. Our culture is very cynical and suspicious. And one of the things that starts to happen when we start to talk to people who are coming fresh out of the culture into the realization that God loves them is what's in it for God. What's He going to take from me to bring these blessings to me? How is this going to limit and ruin my life from now on? What's this Jesus want to do to me? Are we awake? Suspicion and rebellion, fear and rebellion have been natural since the fall in Genesis 3. It is the natural state of human beings to be fearful and rebellious. However, those of us who have been born of the Spirit, those of us who are bearing the fruit of the Spirit, those of us who believe need not to fall into that trap of being cynical, full of fear and rebellion all the time. And understand that not everybody is always working some angle for themselves. And that's one of the things that we get to demonstrate is a relationship where people are loving each other and serving each other and doing it because it's the right thing to do, not because they're going to get something out of it. And everybody's not playing some game where they're trying to manipulate each other into getting their way. I said, I, I'm not going to rehash all of the stuff that we did when we were back in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Some of you will remember on the Wednesday evenings, we spent a, quite a while in 1 Peter chapter 3 talking about the women and the men and the marriage and the situation. But one of the things that I said at that time was that many couples work to try to win. And they see my winning as her losing. Or more appropriately, what they tend to see is her winning is my losing. And so we're going to fight to see who's going to lose. And it isn't going to be me. Are we here? I see nobody but me has ever experienced that. But, there's, but here's the deal with marriage. Because of this thing that God calls one flesh that is a mystery something difficult to understand and needing to be revealed, because of this mystery of this one flesh relationship, which Ephesians 5 is addressing when it says that a man who doesn't love his wife doesn't care for himself. It's saying, in essence, that if she loses, I lose with her. So when both of us fight to win by making the other one lose, we guarantee that we both lose. Because in marriage, in Christ, there is no such thing as a win-lose situation. It's always either lose-lose or win-win. We win when we're one, and anything that doesn't make us one makes us lose. <laughs> Let me say that again. We win when we're one, and anything that doesn't make us one makes us lose. It changes the way you approach a lot of things, doesn't it? This is a huge part of what we're called to model, that we win when we're won, and anything that doesn't make us won makes us lose. That beautifully describes my relationship with Christ. I win when we're won, and anything that doesn't make us won makes me lose. There isn't going to be any giving on his side. I change to be conformed to him, but the pattern is still the same. 
What we're looking for is to be conformed to Him. Right? And in that oneness is victory. And in the absence of it, there is rolling defeat. Are you still glad you came? You're thinking about it. You're not as sure as you were before. Okay. But (laughs) glory to God. Fear and rebellion is natural to the fall. But I'm not natural to the fall anymore, and therefore fear, fear and rebellion can't be natural to me. I need to push back from fear and rebellion and not allow fear and rebellion to take hold of me. Is that making some sense to you? Um, I wasn't perhaps going to do this, but I think we want to do this. I need to... Yes, no, maybe. No, okay. Pardon me. Getting a little coaching here. Uh, Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. He says in verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. We're talking about the establishment of a new household. And that household demands some things of us. But at the heart of that is this statement at the beginning of verse 32. This is a great mystery. Now, mystery, again, in a scriptural context, isn't talking about something necessarily which is difficult to understand once you can get a look at it. It's talking about something which hasn't been revealed. Mysteries are the things that you don't know. And if any, anybody who's ever been married will tell you that there's a lot of stuff that you thought you know that you don't know. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yeah. I, I thought I was ready for my wedding day. I got there. I had on the right clothes. I remembered my lines. It all went very well. I had no idea what I was getting into. Not because this was a bad experience. It was just so very different than what I had imagined. And there were aspects of it that matched what I had imagined, but there was an awful lot of it that was not what I had pictured. And some of it for the better and some of it for the worse and some of it just because it was effort. But it's, there's a good deal that you don't see till you get close to it. And one of our tasks is to take this, as it were, out on the ground, on the mission field, and put it close where people can see it. Nearby where they get a good look at it, because it's something which is difficult to grasp unless you see it clearly. He says, I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This commitment, this relationship becomes, all right, let's, let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 3 for a moment. This is important. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we're not going to take the time to study all of this, but there's this simple statement in verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto your wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, the first six verses are dealing with women. This verse says, likewise, same manner, everything we said about women, you too, but also, here's what you're supposed to do, husbands. Dwell with them according to knowledge. There's a a certain level of study involved in, in, in getting this down. I will readily admit, I wouldn't have at the time, and I'm not proud of it, but I was a boy when I was married. Not because I was youthful, but because I was immature. And I didn't mature because I was married. I don't recommend marriage as a way to mature. I would not recommend that somebody like me get married at that point. The fact that we survived is a testimony to God's grace. Are you awake? 
but having at some point committed myself to knowledge, I discovered that there was a great deal about this that I didn't know, although I thought I knew it all. I, I have a friend who, who used to say frequently, you know, you should have known me years ago. I could have helped you then. I used to know everything. And uh, I, I know exactly how he feels because I used to know everything too. Did anybody used to know everything? <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of things I knew everything about. But uh, moving right along. So he says, giving honor. That's the phrase I want to focus on because I said marriage is honorable. Marriage has a value attached to it. Marriage is worth something is the, is the phrase from if, uh, Hebrews 13.4. Marriage is honorable. Let marriage be marriageable. In, uh, King James says marriage is honorable in all. Um, New American Standard says let marriage be held in honor among all. Marriage has a value attached to it because honor in a biblical sense is talking about a value. It's talking about literally the way that you value something by fixing a price on it. Like if you're running a tag sale in your yard, you go out and hang a tag on something and say, $100, I'm assigning a value to it. I'm telling you what I think it's worth. You may want to argue with me about that, and I may agree with you, and I may not. But by putting that tag on, I'm telling you what I, how much honor I place on that item. When we're told to honor something, that doesn't mean hold the door open for, that doesn't mean bow before, that doesn't mean say something pleasant to. Honor means fix a value on. Now, if fixing a value on something causes you to do those other things, fine. But the way that we honor is not through those activities. It's through treating something as though it has value. Yes. And in this particular case, we're giving honor, assigning a value to having a wife, and he, the word giving here is an interesting word as well because it talks about a purposeful ass assigning. That is to say that I'm consciously choosing to assign a value to her. That's the instruction here, giving honor unto the wife. He's saying that wise folks who don't want their prayers hindered and want an active and lively spiritual life, assign on purpose, because they choose to, value to the other people in their household. Is that coming through? Now, come on back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Is he a good God? Now this, I, I want to say again, there's a very simple point to all of this. This was not intended to be the marriage seminar to end all marriage seminars. In fact, it isn't intended to be a marriage seminar at all. But what I want to do is, this is exactly the way it was impressed on me by the Spirit. This marriage is a difficult assignment. And when people undertake it, we need to see that that's a ministry that we choose to support in prayer. And then any other way that perhaps we're led by the Spirit to do so. But if, if somebody in this congregation jumped up and said that they were going to Guam to start a medical mission or go into Thailand to start an orphanage, as I mentioned earlier, we'd be excited, we'd commit to pray for them, we'd remember them vigorously all the time. If somebody jumped up and said, I'm getting married, we'd say, that's nice, I hope I get an invitation. But we, we should be just as excited and committed about the spiritual aspect of that and our participation in it. We are sending a missionary household out into a neighborhood. And it's an opportunity. And instead of getting sullen because it isn't my opportunity, I should be excited that the kingdom is gaining ground, that the fruit is growing, that God's witness is being declared, that the testimonies are coming, that the illustration is growing. Are you awake? That this, this is something worth having, isn't it? And I can stand with and support those people regardless of what the circumstances and situation of my life are. Amen? My, my children are grown. I don't have any little children anymore, but I still love children because children matter to God. I love children and worked with children before I had children. I love children and worked with children when I had children. And now that I have no little children, I continue to love and work with children. Children matter. 
children are important because children are important, not because I have some. And marriage is important because marriage is important, not because I have some. Are you with me? So, um, recognizing this call, I want to take a moment, I want to read to you again, beginning at verse 22 from Ephesians chapter 5, and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Because this is a ministry, because it is a ministry of, of service to the gospel in presenting the relationship of Christ in the church, I want you to join me in praying for those who uh, endeavor to honor the Lord and answer that call in their marriages here. And so when, as I finish, we're going to stand together, we're going to pray together, and I would like to invite you to join me in that prayer. Is that an amen moment? Yes. So this is, this is the word. Beginning of verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Let's stand together, if you will. And let's take a moment and pray for those who are among us who are endeavoring to answer this call and enter this ministry, enter this service. Amen? Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this illustration you've given us, this opportunity to be kind and loving as you are kind and loving, to be worshipful, to be respectful towards you in loving and respecting each other, in serving each other, in blessing each other. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to demonstrate to others your love, your kindness, your graciousness, your covenantal nature, how firmly you hold covenant, how strongly you keep covenant, the way that you honor promises and value covenant, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to be in, in our neighborhoods, in our social circles, in our communities, as witnesses, carrying this great ministry to those places. And Father, for those who are married in this congregation, who have chosen to answer the call and to endeavor to live their lives, not seeking their own, but serving and serving the gospel by living this illustration before others, we thank you, Father, for strengthening them with might in their innermost being by your Spirit, that they might serve well, that they might be able to serve consistently and persistently, yeah. that they can serve, Father, beyond their own strength and beyond their own wits to the point that they didn't think they could go in service, Father, that they can be gracious and kind, that they can show love and forgiveness, that they can cast aside bitterness and foolishness and selfishness and be the, the men and women that you've called them to be. In the, in the places that you've called them to go, so that folks can see somebody who isn't simply manipulating and serving themselves, so that folks can see somebody who, who is acting out of sincerity and trueness of heart, so that folks can see somebody who honestly desires others' good. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of showing this mystery to this world. And thank you, Father, for your strength to do it in. Again, Father, we speak strength and wisdom to these relationships that the folks in them might serve well and honor you as they hold marriage in honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, I also want to mention to you, the 10th chapter of the book of Romans says at the 9th verse, allow me to read that to you. Right there. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I had a fellow ask me one time, do you mean to say it's just that simple? I said, I didn't say it, I read it. You know, it's not me. I'm not telling you what I think, it's what it says. He looked argumentative when he said it. I thought he wanted to start a fight. It turned out that he was just confused because he thought it had to be more complicated than that. But it isn't. God has said that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus has been raised from the dead and confess with our mouths that He is Lord, that He does something in us, for us, when that happens. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our opportunity to believe has come to us this morning. I'm going to invite you to join me in making this confession and praying this way. Dear God, God, I thank you you in Jesus' name name for hearing me today. I do believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I declare with my mouth Jesus Christ is my Lord. I thank you, Father, for the new birth you've promised, for receiving me to yourself. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen.